Hello, uh, good afternoon to everyone there in the States. Um, here we are at uh, Sheba Medical Center in the heart of uh, Israel. I'm happy to be with you. Um, I would uh, thank uh, Anat Sultan Dodon, the Israeli Consul General in Atlanta, for uh, arranging this special webinar. And I will uh, lead uh, Steve to conduct this uh, webinar. Thank you, Yul, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Good day to all of our distinguished uh, guests from the uh, various healthcare systems, the hospitals, state and federal agencies in the United States, and several more from around the globe. Uh, the COVID-19 virus has accelerated our abilities to use cutting edge technologies to solve problems across a wide spectrum from Zoom to Sheba's ARC Innovation Center. Uh, today, you will actually interact with several of Sheba's world's first COVID-19 technologies, including telemedicine and retrofitted ventilators. The DNA of why we are also, by the way, as you see behind me, a Newsweek top 10 hospital in the world. We are here to accelerate, redesign, and collaborate with you to wage war against the global scourge of COVID-19. We have a distinguished panel of Sheba's experts who are on the front lines of this battle 24-7. Dr. Amir On, Dr. Galia Barkai, and Professor Gili Regev Yochai. Now, before I introduce uh, Dr. On to kick things off, I want to also mention and say todarabana thanks to the Israeli Consul General in Atlanta for creating this webinar. This is something unique and actually, I would say, historic. Mm -hmm. Professor? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Amir On, and I'm a Chair of Pulmonary Medicine here at Tel Shomer. On a regular day, I'm dealing with lung cancer. I diagnose and manage patients with lung cancer. But in the recent month, I've been focusing on the uh, evaluation and management of uh, patients with suspected uh, pneumonia and all sorts of uh, abnormalities regarding their breathing and also doing some uh, bronchoscopies for bronchial alveolar lavage on patients in our corona COVID-19 ICU. So regarding the uh, first uh, part, we're dealing with uh, patients who are having uh, presumably uh, COVID-19 or other infections in their sputum. And uh, the sputum may be found in the aerosol when they cough. So we had initially to stop all the uh, procedures that are done in the Institute of Pulmonary Medicine. And only slowly but surely we renewed all the services, ensuring the safety of the uh, uh, team, the medical team and the patients that uh, no one will get harm. Regarding bronchoscopies, as you are fully aware, there's uh, a risk of uh, infection, co-infection, because of the uh, cough and, again, spread of the virus with the aerosol. And we had to take special precautions uh, to protect our team. And in fact, at least in one patient that I uh, recall, the uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 was uh, made only after the uh, bronchoscopy, yet the team was fully uh, protected and no harm was uh, done to the uh, team. So we were able to continue the uh, activity of the institute. Regarding bronchoscopies in the uh, uh, corona ICU, we do it to rule out secondary infection, uh, which may happen in these uh, patients, and uh, we do it on an on a almost daily uh, basis. We have a large ICU unit, and you will hear more about it uh, later on. Regarding our activities in uh, the, uh, uh, in the uh, generation of alternatives to conventional ventilators, so the uh, Ministry of Health here in Israel set a goal to have 6,000 <coughs> ventilators ready for the end of uh, June. And for this reason, we have collaborated with a special unit in our army, part of the intelligence forces. On normal days, they're doing all sorts of things that we should not discuss aloud. But during the war against the corona, we were collaborating with them to develop a unique ventilator. We took a conventional BiPAP, that's a device that we use on a regular basis for a non ventilate, as a non-invasive ventilator, and set a module, set a unit that can control it, 
and assure the uh, function and the safety of uh, this device if we need to use it in the lack of conventional ventilators. And I suggest that we'll watch a movie that will describe the activity of this uh, device. Please. Hi, I'm Galia Barkai. I'm a head of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Unit and also uh, responsible for telemedicine uh, in ARC, the, uh, the Innovation Center of Sheba. And I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, what we did uh, in Sheba uh, using uh, telemedicine uh, services to, uh, to deal with some of the special challenges that were brought to us by COVID-19. Okay, so our story began uh, on February 16, when uh, Israel uh, did not have yet uh, a, a corona patients uh, in Israel, and we were asked by the ministry uh, uh, to bring back the Israelis on the Diamond Princess cruise ship uh, home, and we knew that some of them might have coronavirus, although they were negative when they were tested on the cruise ship. So we had about two, three days to uh, um, find a new location to uh, put them in isolation. And what we decided is to take uh, a facility that was dormitories of students here next to Sheba. It was isolated and outside uh, of the main campus. That's why we chose this facility. And what we wanted to do here was to create a new uh, model of treatment of patients in which uh, we still continue to give the highest level of medical care that we're used to give, but uh, now we had another goal, and it was maximal crew protection. So in order to do that, we also used in, uh, minimal physical contact measures. Uh, what we did is actually to locate the, the, the patients. The first it was the, the patients from the cruise ship, and then other patients when they started to come in, in the facility, while the medical staff was located outside of the facility in an inflatable tent in which they had all kinds of uh, screens uh, and technologies uh, which allowed them to communicate and monitor the patients inside. We called it the teletent since it was a tent from which we uh, did telemedicine with our patients. So we wanted to harness the telemedicine technologies that we have, we were already starting to use before. Uh, for three main um, uh, things. First of all, the most important was communication because we knew we had to communicate with the pa patients in, a, in the best way we could in order to prevent our entrance there. Then we also wanted to monitor them and we, were, uh, we wanted to be able to perform physical examination in case we needed to perform physical examination if they got sick. So for communication, we used all kinds of backups like telephones, cell phones, and emergency press buttons. But the most effective uh, communication means was uh, um, provided by an Israeli startup, Uniper. Uniper actually is a simple TV box that we put on the, on the TV screen, and it turns the television into an interactive uh, uh, TV. It has a customized, uh, easy-to-use remote control with a built-in microphone and a small web camera, uh, which allows the patients to communicate uh, with, Al, with the, the staff outside with, the ease of, uh, with, with a very easy and efficient way. This is the way we did all the daily video rounds. We used it also for group visits. This is uh, Professor uh, uh, Gili Regev um, explaining to the first patients about COVID-19 and the isolation measures that, that are needed. 
Uh, this is a social worker and a psychologist doing uh, 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 sessions with the patients since we understood that was a very, uh, this was a need that was needed to, uh, to address the psychological uh, state of the patients because of the isolation and it was prolonged in the first patients. And we even made a, a family room for virtual visits where we put this the same UNIPER system uh, for the families to communicate with the patients that were inside. The second thing we wanted to do is to monitor the patients. Uh, we used a very easy and efficient way. It was self-examination and reporting of vital signs. We left them in the rooms, uh, blood pressure cuffs, uh, uh, thermometers, and oxygen, a pulse oximeter, uh, a pulse oximeters for saturations, and they would check their vital signs by their own. Uh, but we also left them uh, an other technologies for uh, monitoring. The first of them was EarlySense. EarlySense is uh, also an Israeli startup now based in Boston. Uh, <clears throat> it's a contact-free continuous monitoring uh, system that monitors your heart rate, respiratory rate, and motions, but it also has an algorithm, an, an a, a, a artificial intelligent algorithm that can predict clinical deterioration. This is how uh, you see when you look when you looked at the trends of the patients. When you start to seeing uh, a higher respiratory rate and a heart rate, uh, it can be an indicator even before fever rises that the patient is going to deteriorate. The third thing that we wanted to do is physical examination, and for that we used uh, also an Israeli uh, system named Titocare. Titocare is actually a kit. Uh, a very small uh, machine that can become a stethoscope or an otoscope. Uh, it can uh, help you listen to the patient's heart and lungs and watch uh, the ears and throat, and that way make a th in that way uh, you can make a thorough physical examination. Uh, you communicate with a patient with a physician through an uh, application because we didn't uh, want to. Um, depend on the, their need to download an app to their phones. We left them also tablets in the room with the application already downloaded to the tablet to make it easier to use. So this is Dr. Gadi Segal performing physical examination uh, with the use of Taito Care. Also, we used uh, the InTouch telepresence robot, which is uh, a, a a robot is a, not a very uh, clear uh, way to put it. It's also it's a telepresence uh, device which allows us to contact uh, the staff that do have to go into the the special care room when patients deteriorate, and uh, to uh, communicate with the physician inside. It has a very good camera, and it can be um, uh, it can be uh, used from the outside and directed to see uh, many aspects of the patient and the patient monitor. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't use it that much, but uh, when we continued to have more, uh, we, we continued uh, as the, the pandemic uh, became, uh, as we began to say, see more and more patients, and we actually, uh, Sheba built uh, an ICU, a special ICU for COVID-19 patient in uh, the parking lot in an underground par parking lot. We had the, their much severe, uh, much more severe patients, and then we did see that this technology of the telepresence is crucial to help communicate between the patients and the, phys the staff that has to be inside the ICU with most of the staff that is outside, located in a separate room, as you can see on your left. So this is what we did. Uh, to uh, help us, uh, this is the way we use telemedicine services and technologies to treat inpatients. That was the first time in which we used these technologies to treat inpatients. Usually telemedicine was used to take care of patients that are distant and cannot arrive to the hospital. But as we began to admit more and more patients, we, be, we understood that most of the patients that are not so sick would have to be outside of the hospital. And therefore, we prepared for uh, the option to, uh, uh, of home hospitalization for these patients uh, that do not have to be in the hospital. For this, we use the Shiba Datos Health app. I won't go into details of the levels of, uh, of severity of the patients, but we created a system that allowed us uh, to monitor patients from their, uh, in their homes 
using self measurements of vital signs, uh, uh, reminders with us with our uh, applications, and also questionnaires about the physical state, and on call physicians, and video visit by the treating physicians. Uh, for uh, more severe patients, we had an extended program, which I won't go into it uh, right now. So actually, we made a zero-touch telemedicine toolkit that we could use not only for inpatients, but also for outpatients with corona in their houses. Um, the third thing that we, we began to understood as, as the measures of social distancing and lockdown were, were employed, that we would have to allow continuity of care, we wanted to allow continuity of care to all the Sheba patients that are treated uh, from, uh, that are treated in Sheba and cannot come now to their outpatient clinics. And for this, uh, we uh, also use the DATUS platform to allow us to easily communicate with the patients. We send them an, a text message. They only have to press on a uh, link, and then they're directed directly to speak with their physician, and that allows us to uh, make virtual visits instead of the in-hospital visits. In a very short uh, period of about one and a half weeks, 10 days, we were able to deploy uh, this system widely in the hospital. Uh, more than uh, 1,200 users of the technology, um, staff members using the technology, not only physicians, but also nurses, uh, psychologists, physiotherapists, and others. Uh, and we all, uh, nowadays we have at least uh, 600 or 700 uh, video visits per day in Sheba. So if we want to sum it up, these are all our telemedicine efforts. We uh, allowed uh, our patients uh, medical care uh, in the hospital uh, in, uh, for the patients in isolation with corona. We allowed the uh, home hospitalization for corona patients. We, we made a system that would be soon uh, available for, for all Israeli citizens via the Ministry of Health. And we allowed for continuity of care of non-corona ambulatory patients. We also, uh, through ARC, which is our, our innovation uh, uh, center, we, we performed uh, all kinds of research and innovation uh, projects uh, mediated for uh, uh, um, targeted, targeting cor coronavirus as well. Okay, so uh, to sum it up, I want to say that uh, telemedicine can provide comprehensive services uh, and solution that's highly scalable. The technology already exists, and we started using it before, but the coronavirus uh, pandemic, of course, uh, boosted that up. Uh, and the times of crisis in this, uh, in this uh, side can present opportunity, and it might be remembered as a turning point for digital transformation in general, but uh, telemedicine specifically. Thank you. Uh, before uh, I turn the microphone over to Professor Yochai, uh, Dr. Owen has to leave in a few minutes. Dr. Owen, again, uh, this technology for retrofitting uh, these uh, ventilators, we know that there's a, a, an international patent between the IDF and Sheba, and we know that there's interest in the United States from this. How long will it be before we're able to see, perhaps, can able to help our friends across the pond? The uh, system is actually ready to be used, and we use it as uh, when in Israel, when there are no more ventilators, uh, no, not enough ventilators to, to our patients. But as of today, we have uh, 100 units of uh, the module, the brain of the system that can be uh, sent anywhere on the globe and assist all those who are in need for ventilators and do not have enough needs. Uh, ventilators, enough, have enough uh, machines. Just want to emphasize that we are not, uh, we do not believe in those ventilators that, that you use for several patients, and we uh, don't want because the uh, uh, pathology in many of these patients differ from one to the other. In addition, we don't want to spread any uh, infection from one patient to the other. So this is a real backup backup device that again is ready to be used when no other uh, when all the conventional uh, devices have been exhausted
Thank you. And have a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, now we turn our attention to Professor Gili Regev Yochai, who literally is on the front lines of battling uh, the COVID virus every day, uh, together with a whole group of uh, talented people. In the last uh, couple of days, there have been some interesting stories that have come out about the, whether there are different uh, strains of this, and every day we're reading about another weird type of uh, symptom. What have you seen? You've seen now, what, about 400 patients, uh, corona patients here at Sheba, uh, the most of any in the Middle East, I would assume. So let's uh, bring everybody up to speed on, on what you're doing and what you're seeing. I'm the director of the Infection Prevention and Control Unit at the Sheba Medical Center. And the main focus uh, actually is changing with the pandemic as it's moving forward. And what we have been uh, uh, doing initially is really uh, all of the preparedness for the, uh, the pandemic. How do you actually uh, continue the routine life of a hospital together with treating coronavirus uh, patients? How do we put them uh, distantly, as distant as we can? That's why we built the ICU underground, different place, not in the hospital, so we have still the regular ICU, we have the regular ER, but we have a specified uh, and very uh, um, separate um, place for the coronavirus patients. Um, what we're currently uh, focusing on is actually moving to the second phase of this pandemic when we start understanding that we need to live with the coronavirus. It's probably not going away. We're gonna have these waves back and forth. We assume we're gonna have a large wave in the winter. So we have corona now for uh, a few months ahead with us. Uh, and the main question is how do we actually continue treating patients? People still have acute MIs, they have CVA, um, you know, life is continuing while we are treating the coronavirus. So that's the main focus currently of my unit, trying to uh, deal with how is life going to be living with corona? How do we keep a hospital telling people not to come in if they are visitors? Only the patients can come in and not allowing a visitor in. And, you know, it, it's a very, I don't know, horrible disease, I would say, in this aspect. Uh, very unhuman and very uh, against what we are used to as physicians. You know, the first thing we do with a patient is touch him. Now we're not allowed to touch. We keep everything distant. And I think as you've just seen with what uh, Galia Barkai has explained, how we succeed with telemedicine to still keep uh, you know, proper medicine, despite the distance that we need to keep. That's uh, one issue of it. The other is how do we keep patients far w from each other? How do we um, um, uh, ed educate actually the public to understand what this whole uh, pandemic is? Initially, everybody's afraid. They don't want to go to the hospital. Now we want to let them come in when they need it, but keep safe while they're in the hospital. So I think that's the main focus of what we've been doing. Uh, and of course, the, the working together with the infectious disease unit, who is working on treating the patients. And I think one important thing of why we really want to lower the curb is because we, ha we need time. We need time to learn the virus. We know each day more about what the right treatment is, or what uh, maybe I would say it the other way around, uh, what we've been doing, which we thought in this initially uh, might be right, and maybe it's not the correct thing, uh, and we learn more and more about the virus. The other thing that we are currently focusing on right now is diagnosis, of course, uh, rapid diagnosis. And one issue is the serology, which we're working on, but some other new technologies technologies with some high-tech uh, companies, uh, some of them based on smell, uh, which might uh, eventually give some interesting results. If we can just identify the patient as he comes in the hospital, you are corona or you're not corona, that will be so uh, much helpful. And that's another thing that currently we're, we're working on. 
I think also uh, what we share in common with the United States, uh, Professor Yochai, is that uh, the challenge to keep our, our professional uh, staff safe and away from, uh, now I know it's almost mission impossible, what are some of the protocols that we are using here at Sheba to keep our medical professionals safe uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? So I think with that, the one thing which is also very difficult is uh, explaining how dynamic this is. Every time we learn something new, we're changing it. And as we get more PPE, we can be more generous with it. Uh, initially, we understood that we have a very uh, big limitation with PPE. There were not enough masks, obviously not enough N N95 masks. Uh, where do we need it? How do we save them just for the proper use? Uh, currently, there's a little bit more, so we can be a little bit more generous. And as the uh, healthcare workers feel uh, more secure, obviously the treatment will be much better. So right now we're using, uh, we have different protection levels according to how much uh, exposure you have to the corona uh, patient, but we understand that with the emergence of the uh, pandemic, if right now we have maybe less than 1% patients coming in with corona, uh, and we also know which ones are the high risk, in a month or two, we're gonna have every patient being suspected as having corona. How do we treat that? Do we go around everywhere with the N95? All of these are questions that you know are very dynamic. So I don't think there's one specific qu uh, answer. And you know I'll, I'll be available for any questions if there is a. Spe what are we currently using? We uh, encourage uh, our participants from the medical community who are online with us that if they have any specific questions for uh, Galia Barkayi and, and Gili to please send them as quickly as possible. Uh, Galia, I'd like to uh, I, I'd like to ask you a, a question regarding. Uh, before Corona, telemedicine was a very hot topic and continues to be a hot topic at Sheba in that uh, we are using telemedicine in ways that haven't been done before. And I think that it's important to, to tell people how we were already a world's first in some of the ways that we were doing uh, you know, some of the, the new telemedicine technologies. So I'll try to answer Steve's question regarding the technologies that we were already using. So the truth is that indeed uh, uh, this, this pandemic boosted very much the use of technology uh, and telemedicine practices, but the, the, the way that we, we were able to, to uh, implement it very widely because We've already been started using them and, and making the, the grounds ready for it. One of the programs that we were already uh, starting to deploy, or we already deployed, is a program for home hospitalization for psychiatric patients. We've been doing this for at least uh, four or five months already with a few tens of patients. We, uh, the model is that patients that come to the hospital and need to be hospitalized in the psychiatric ward, in a closed psychiatric ward, are uh, given, are staying one night, overnight. They're giving, uh, they're trained on the technology and they're given tablets and self-checking uh, 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 equipment. And then they go home and they continue all their interaction with the staff uh, via telemedicine and also uh, some uh, vital signs and monitors monitored through Garmin watches that are on them. So it monitors their, uh, their movement, their steps, their uh, pulse, and also their sleep patterns, which is really important for a psychiatric patient. Uh, another program that we have here is um, cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, that's also performed from distance with our DATOS application. Patients are received also a Garmin watch and a speci special cardiac rehabilitation application. And it allows many of the patients that are not uh, uh, able to access physical cardiac rehabilitation system. We already have uh, data to show that it is non-inferior to uh, cardiac rehabilitation that's performed in the hospital. And it's much more convenient for the patients. So we do all these things using technology, which I think are 
are some of them are first in the world even the yes, psychiatric uh, hospitalization is is one of the first in the world i believe and we are going to continue this with or without uh COVID-19, there's, uh, there's a whole game plan, as far as I understand, to extend all of these home care services using mm -hmm. the telemedicine, which I would think that COVID-19 has actually pushed us faster into the future regarding uh, all of these technologies. Would you, uh, would you say De so? Yeah, definitely. I, I think the world has changed. Uh, we're physicians, we always, as, as Professor uh, Gili Regev Yochai said, we always prefer to touch the patient, to see them physically. Uh, but I think uh, telemedicine technologies are enforcing us. They allow us to do it when it's not possible. And also by means of, of more, uh, more uh, advanced technology, we can monitor patients, have more, much more information regarding their uh, clinical status. So I believe it enforces us, even if we go back to old days when we can see all the patients, touch them with no fear of getting uh, the disease. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yochai, uh, everybody, every country out there has their own uh, you know, estimates and speaks a lot about flattening the curve. Actually, I, I'm trying to figure out myself what that really means and, and has Israel flattened the curve because we see numbers change every day. Yeah, so uh, I'll say uh, definitely Israel has uh, succeeded. Many countries have, and Israel has succeeded it really uh, tremendously. I would even say much more than I uh, expected. Uh, what it means is that if the uh, exponential uh, increase in the cases is going up as it did, as we've seen in Italy, in Wuhan, uh, and if we succeed to lower the curb, uh, or flatten it, uh, then we have less cases. And the whole idea is to have something that is within the capacity of the ICU. I think that's the major uh, aim, to actually have the capacity in the ICU, and we really succeeded it. So one thing is to extend the capacity, and we've din done that very nicely here at Chiba. We had originally uh, only 14 beds of general ICU. We have in total about 80 beds of ICU, including pediatric, including neurosurgery, but just general ICU, we have something in the routine between 14 to 16 beds. Currently, we are prepared for nearly up to 100 beds. Uh, right now, we have 30 uh, beds uh, with patients uh, of ICU. And that is one way that we are actually extending our capacity. So even if the curb is not lowered all the way, we are fine. What we have done in Israel, uh, and that is what the government has done, is really a very um, proper, I would say, lockdown. Uh, it was during the holidays. We had the Passover holidays. And that was very uh, extreme to, to have uh, the Seder evening only with your, uh, your small family, your, uh, with, with no uh, grandparents around, no larger family, only four to five people, sometimes only two people, and even adults only by themselves. Uh, they had a TV doing a seder on that night. I think that was very extreme, but that definitely succeeded to lower the curb, and we see it currently. We have mortality uh, uh, rates which are much lower than most of the countries around. We have currently nearly 180, I think, one, 180 uh, um, mortality cases, uh, while we have over 13,000 uh, cases which uh, we know of. Um, and I think that was done mainly by the lockdown. Just a few days ago, the lockdown was pulled, and the question is when are we going to have the next lockdown because I expect that the cases will increase. I hope they're not going to increase exponentially, definitely not as they have initially. And that is because people are more educated. Uh, there is a lot of uh, PR going around about, you know, how we have to be careful. I think people understood that this disease is serious. It's not just the flu. So people do put on the masks even in the street. People uh, keep apart two meters in most places, not all. Uh, and the more we will succeed with educating the, uh, the general population, 
the better we will still keep the uh, uh, curb flat. I, again, I expect it to go up, and as it will go up, we may need further lockdowns, and I expect to sort of have these small waves until we'll have to see what, how much seasonality plays a role, and that we'll know, I guess, only in the winter. Uh, probably the better the summer will be, I expect the worse the winter will be. That's unfortunate, but I, I assume that is what we're going to, uh, we, we should be expecting. Professor Yochai, uh, I understand that, uh, well, we know for a fact that Sheba is uh, known as a hospital that does thousands of clinical trials a year. Obviously, we're doing uh, trials with different drugs that have been mentioned as the, the godsend of all. Which drugs uh, have you been working with and with those that might show signs of promise going forward? Well, currently, Sheba is involved in several uh, clinical trials. I would say the probably most promising, and maybe Galia Ewell is Rendezivir, exactly. Uh, we have currently, I think, two patients uh, recruited. Uh, we have uh, also going on uh, a trial on hydroxychloroquine, and we're doing some uh, national trial with uh, plasma. Uh, I guess probably I would say the most hopeful is the remdesivir. And uh, have uh, which uh, other hospitals and and other universities that we we use uh, a lot and do collaborations during the year? How many uh, have uh, been working with you to try and exchange information? Because the exchange of information going forward. Uh, is important and, and another interesting question is is that do you believe that environment every country seems to have different types of symptoms uh, is it do you believe that environment and also an aging population in some countries over uh, a country like ours that has a mixed population and we do have a mixed group of uh, corona patients in various uh, units here what have you discovered over the last six weeks where we've had to deal with this I think that's too early probably to uh, say anything really, uh, you know, intelligent enough on this and, and based, evidence based on this. Uh, we'll need more genetic trials to know more whether there is something that, you know, different populations will have. It. I, I would say it's too early to say anything like that. Uh, we, time will tell. I, I don't know. You have other uh, thoughts on this, Galia? No. 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 Uh, but, uh, what percentage uh, of Israelis uh, have been tested, you believe? Uh, anything that we have, any statistics about how many uh, Israelis have been tested based on, on population? On, uh, In terms of percentage of uh, the Israeli population, how many have been tested? Because the numbers do change every day. Yeah, but the testing, again, we have to remember, is only for symptomatic patients. So we don't really have any idea of how much the population uh, exposure is. We need more trials, and actually we're carrying one uh, uh, at Chiba on asymptomatic patients, because I think that's one of the questions. How many patients are asymptomatic compared to the symptomatic? Is it 50%, 10%, some say more? I think we need to know that in order, first of all, to really calculate the true uh, uh, case fatality uh, uh, um, ratio and the mortality rates, the, the true ones. So we, I don't think we have those data right now. I mean, the numbers tested are just the numbers who are symptomatic. It will not really tell us enough. I think more we learn right now is how many severe cases we have. That's probably what we know more of, you know, how, how bad the, uh, the pandemic right, uh, right now is. Galia, uh, the, the, regarding the, the telemedicine program through the Teletent, uh, you know, uh, you've dealt with hundreds of patients now and uh, I'm very curious and I'm sure our, our people who are listening are curious to know about yes it's a, a very difficult that you can't touch someone but yet I believe that there, there is a human perspective even in what you're doing with the teletent you may not be able to touch them physically but 
I know that you invest a lot of time in trying to bring them in an up-to-meet manner and do exercises with them. What has been the feedback from the patients themselves to this new telemedicine program? Because obviously it's going to be used going forward, whether it's going to be COVID-19, God forbid, another pandemic, and used for home care. The feedback from patients, I think, is important uh, for you as a doctor and, and also for the, for the human beings that you've treated during the course of this uh, epidemic. So, so as, I, as I said before, the most important thing was for us to be able to communicate with the patients and this video, video communication allowed us uh, to, to commu communicate with them very well and to grab the feeling, the fact that they had big TV screens in the room, it was easy to communicate, we can hear them and speak to them. I think Gilly also, uh, Professor Regev also felt the same way when she contacts the patients. So it's, uh, uh, we put a lot of efforts in being able to make them more, uh, uh, the communication easier and better and more effective. And also other things that we did, like arranging for them places, places to go outside, raising, uh, organizing, uh, I don't know, sports sessions, group sessions, uh, even uh, the social worker and psychologist, we even used uh, virtual reality uh, to make uh, uh, all kinds of session for sessions for relaxation. So we do believe that people that are isolated, it's really hard for them and they, we need to uh, employ excess measures to com continue to communicate with them. And actually the people that come out, they really feel, uh, mostly with the doctors, the physicians that are treated them, they're really, really thankful for those efforts that are made. And I believe some, many of them do feel that uh, an effective communication can be made uh, with those means. Okay, so Maybe I'll, I'll just please. Add to that, that yeah, for me also, it was really a surprise to see <laughs> the, the amazing, uh, you know, things that you can achieve with Zoom. And it gave me thoughts on, you know, initially people said to me like uh, uh, tele, uh, not medicine, but tele-education for, for uh, schools is, you know, it won't work. And once I saw how, you know, you had group meetings and the psychologist would do like a group dynamics, it was, uh, for me, it was unbelievable. It was amazing. And, and the sessions that I held with them where I was just teaching them and everybody was asking questions, I think. You know, now we're already a month, two months into this. Everybody's using Zoom. It seems more uh, uh, something like we, we live with it. Initially, it was really surprising. And, and yeah, and I think it, it definitely can work. And, uh, yeah, I and I think as it was surprising to Professor Wegev, it was surprising to many of our physicians. And it helped us to reduce barriers because people that are already using it and tried it and see that it's not so terrible and communicate, you can communicate very well. And, and, and save the need for patients to come many times. Yeah, I think that it won't go back to what it was before. People so that's will the revolution. This is a revolution. Uh, it's the revolution for telemedicine. I'm sure of it. Okay. One last question to the both of you. And, and it changes every day. What has been the biggest surprise <laughs> uh, medically about COVID-19 for the both of you going forward too? It'll be more surprises along the way. Um, for me, I think the whole disease, you know, if initially I thought this is going to be something like flu, it's not the flu, it's nothing like the flu. And I think the, you know, this disease is really something else. This virus, now that we're starting to learn the serology, I'm afraid that here again we're going to have surprises. It's not, you know, the typical uh, uh, increase in first IgM, then IgG, and then it goes, the IgM goes down. We see it going both together up. We see, you know, I, I have a feeling that this virus is really going to uh, change a lot of our thoughts on, 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 on the disease. Uh, you know, there, there was a question on men. I have no idea why men have more. Another uh, observation that the Chinese already published and we're starting to see it, that type, uh, type of blood makes a difference. That A plus, there are more men with A plus. Why is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not so good to be A plus. You get <laughs> worse disease. So, so yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we have so much to learn uh, that, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. And the clinical course is also surprising, the severe, severe pneumonia that is very typical on the blood clots everywhere and the inflammatory process. Everything is, is not typical. And for me as a pediatrician, what's most surprising is the way it, it, the, the disease is in children. 
we see uh, uh, the, the disease is much, much less severe in children, and now we're getting few signs of that, that maybe children don't transmit it as, as much as we believe they would, as in, for example, influenza. This is not influenza, it's a completely different story. Just today or yesterday, it was publi published that a nine-year-old boy that was exposed to 170 person did not infect anyone. And actually, we saw here children that were hospitalized with their parents and the parents did not contract the disease. So maybe there is something really different about the transmission mode of this disease especially in children, and we don't know anything about it yet. Right. We'll and have we, to learn we, about it. We've had uh, uh, pregnant women who were positive for the coronavirus give birth to children who had no symptoms and were clear uh, of the coronavirus. So there are still many mysteries that need to be solved uh, going forward. I thank you, uh, both of you, for participating in this. I also would like to, again, apologize uh, for the technical difficulties during the course of uh, this uh, Zoom session. Again, as I mentioned at the top of the, uh, top of the broadcast, or top of the Zoom session, uh, we are well, willing, ready, and able to share our knowledge and technology to anyone who will reach out to us, and we'd be more than happy to conduct even uh, smaller uh, chats on Zoom, which we do almost every day here at Sheba. So we'd like to thank uh, everyone for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, and have a good afternoon.